Hello everyone, oh, Shkanda here. Today is gonna be the first part of my video series about the uh, capital of my homeland, Kiev. Or Kiev. Depends on how you prefer. So, Kiev has been historically one of the main towns, cities in the region. And uh, of course, you may have heard of the Kievan Rus, something that used to be quite a dominant country back in. 10th century, 11th century, something like this, used to be quite a prosperous state in the Eastern Europe, with good, by that time, economy, quite great army, and uh, yeah, it was carrying, of course, the name of the main city, which used to be the capital back then. One would imagine there's probably some mysterious and mythical legend how the name of the city appeared, and uh, you know, so I think every Ukrainian knows that it all started from Ki, Shek, Horif, these are the brothers, and their sister, Dim. So, what is exactly this tale telling us? Well, it tells us that Ki, who used to be the oldest brother, he started a small town together with his brothers, which they called after the elder brother. Kiev. And I mean, I think there are some different versions of this legend, because this one may sound quite simplistic, and I think, um, I think I something to remember about Libby also um, turning to the actual swan, because pretty much in Ukrainian Libby means swan. However, it may be just my memory playing tricks on me and nothing like this ever existed and I never knew anything about it. And this whole story is super trivial. That is why... Um, I mean... That, that there is a legend. So, let's see what I actually managed to visit this time. So, I started my journey on the street called Velika Vasilkivska and basically this is... Uh, one of the biggest streets in Kyiv. One of the parts of it starts from the square of Leo Tolstoy, who, as you may know, is a famous Russian writer. You would wonder then why there is a square named after him. I would answer you, because he visited Kyiv once in his life. For some people who wanted to call something after him, that was enough reason to do that. Well, anyhow, so this Velika Vasilkivska, it actually has uh, quite some different landmarks over it. So, Palace, Ukraine. Basically, it is the um, concert hall where a lot of bigger events are usually happening, and um, I never actually visited it myself, and uh, during that time it was exactly the first day of the Ukrainian another lockdown, so I wasn't really even able to visit anything anymore, but it's uh, quite a memorable place and I think a lot of people usually enjoy the concert that happened around it. Um, it was quite peculiar that actually at that point of a time there was um, a small event, or at least the remains of the small event, which was dedicated to, I think, something like Christmas or New Year's time. And I was quite surprised that it was out there, as uh, I was around March back then. It's definitely something that I didn't expect to see. Nevertheless, as you go on the street of Velika Vasilkivska, you would see a lot of beautiful buildings that were actually constructed back there in about 19th century. You would also can tell this by the style that all those buildings are uh, made in. And the street actually received their name because it used to be the way to go from Kiev to Vasilky. Vasilets, Vasilets, I think that's the name of the other town. And uh, that's why, because it's quite a wide street, quite a big one. I mean, it's, it's fine, it's fine. There are quite a lot of traffic going around in it. So it's uh, one of the dominant streets, I think, in Kiev. And, um, yeah, there are quite other things to spectacle. So, of course, I think one of the other newer landmarks, there is a monument dedicated to Gungadze, who used to be a journalist that was brutally murdered. I think his head was cut off, as far as I remember. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was around 15 years ago. 
and um, there were some allegations that the former president of Ukraine, Leonid Kuchma, was sort of connected to his uh, murderer, but uh, still, it's like semi unsolved. Basically, he became a symbol for those journalists who fight for the freedom of speech, and uh, that's how he got a monument after him, which is also located on Veliky Vasilkivsky Street. Then, as we go closer to the Leo Tolstoy Square, we would, of course, witness one of the greatest Gothic buildings in Kiev, which is Roman Catholic St. Nicholas Church. Yeah, so it's uh, perhaps one of the few buildings of uh, Roman Catholic style, of Roman Catholic churches, because, um, well, as you may know, Ukraine is an Orthodox country, predominantly, and basically this uh, church was built um, as the Polish community was growing in Kiev back at the beginning of 20th century, end of 19th century. That's why they funded and built this beautiful piece of architecture, and luckily to our days it managed to survive through the times of Soviet Union, when there was a lot of war against the religious buildings, and um, yeah, I think we all are lucky to witness how great it is, and I think it's one of the most beautiful churches um, that are there in Kiev. As we will be getting closer and closer to Leo Tolstoy Square, pretty much almost right next to it, there is the main sports stadium, sports complex called Olymp Olympijski or Olympic National Sports Complex. Pretty much it is a huge stadium that's located in Kiev, one of our main stages for a lot of different sports. Final of uh, Euro 2012, which was um, shared between Poland and Ukraine, was actually happening in Kyiv on exactly that stadium, and its capacity is around 80,000 people. So it is one of the biggest stadiums, and it still looks great after the reconstruction that was made before the Euro. So it's uh, one of the great landmarks that are left after that um, football holidays that we were having. Anyhow, so that's it. And then once we are entering the Leo Tolstoy Square, it actually quite a small and a bit sad square. So right in the middle of it there is a monument dedicated again to Euro 2012, and uh, there are some older buildings are surrounding it. And of course, um, this is sort of not really a square, but more like an intersection of three streets. And uh, if we are going a bit more to the north or a bit upper, we would be able to go into the park that is right in front of the Tara Shevchenko National University, which is, I think, one of the most respected universities in Ukraine. The peculiar part of it is that the main building is uh, have this weird red color, so it's like painted in this red, um, pinkish color that just um, definitely not something you would see on most of the universities around the world, and that's I think what really makes that specific university quite peculiar. Then close to it there is the building that is a National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. Pretty much the name says for it what it actually is, and then Right on the opposite side from this small park that's separating the Tarashevchenko National University. And of course, actually in the middle of the park there is also the monument dedicated to Tara Shevchenko. He was a famous writer, and one of the most prominent ones for Ukrainian literature and culture. While I think um, most of people would know the other famous Shevchenko, who is um, the winner of Ballon d'Or of 2004, I think, or 5. Andriy Shevchenko, who used to be a striker for Milan, Italian team. And I think usually most of the people know him. But this is a different Shevchenko. We even name the university after the football player. We're not that crazy. No. We have other people to be proud of. So, basically, on the other side of the park, there is also the Hanenko Museum, 
which basically a museum that was established, made of fully from the collection of um, Hanenko family, who at the beginning of 20th century, I think, the, when the Hanenko husband passed away, his wife decided to establish this art gallery, named it after him, and basically now I think it's called the Museum of Western on Oriental Art, and there are different pieces in it, and of course, back at that time it was closed, but I visited it a few years ago, and there are some uh, great works that are still available to see, and of course those are originals, and I think one of the most prominent ones would be the work from um, Peter Paul Rubens, and of course there are some other ones, but uh, honestly I can't recall at this point. Then basically we can either go downhill and we'll enter Hirschatik, or we can go in the opposite direction and we'll go and see two other peculiar landmarks that are situated not far away. One of them is the National Opera of Ukraine. It is a gorgeous building and I've actually once uh, was lucky enough to visit it for one of the Christmas time concerts and they were playing Johann Strauss, which I'm a big fan of uh, from the classical composers. That is why uh, definitely was a great experience for me to visit it. It was built again in the 19th century. I think a lot of buildings in Kyiv that are still around are exactly from that time. And uh, National Opera is just ah, the beauty. The beauty that I think everybody should visit some point of time, of course, for some of the concerts. I think sometimes they were also using it to do some kind of a light show on the walls of the facade of the building. And I remember me and my grandma, who is now living in Kyiv, we actually, um, after the concert where we went together, we then also witnessed the, the light show, which was uh, entertaining, let's put it this way. Like, I personally wasn't amazed or anything, but I think it was great also that they decided to use it in such a way. So there is probably more utility and more happiness for just a random bypassers who would decide to just stand there and check it out. Then of course, another bigger landmark that is not far from the National Opera is St. Volodymyr's Cathedral. And first of all, this is peak of such a landmark, it's not because the name of the saints is the same as mine, but just because it's also one of the most important churches, cathedrals in Ukraine. So St. Volodymyr's Cathedral again was built in our beloved 19th century and initially it was dedicated to the anniversary of the baptism of Kiev and Rus that was made exactly by St. Volodymyr, who used to be a князь or Count Volodymyr at that point of time. And uh, basically, so it was built in this Neo-Byzantine style, so you know, more like looking at how the Greek churches are looking, so it's not necessarily what usually you would imagine when you would be thinking about the Orthodox Eastern Europe Orthodox Church, or at least like Ukraine or Russian um, Orthodox churches, like that. So the style, I think, is uh, quite interesting, and also by itself, the interior of it is uh, gorgeous as well. An interesting fact from the history of the cathedral, that it actually used to be anti-religious museum. This reorganization during the Soviet times, um, as you may have heard, during the Soviet times there was a war declared against the religion, and the religion was uh, considered to be the opium for the people, for the folk. That's why um, a lot of churches and cathedrals were destroyed um, just because of uh, religion not being the, one of the pillars on which the Soviet Union was built, and actually it was an atheistic country where people were still religious, but it was something that you could not have uh, publicly shown. So as we would go back and down the road, which basically we will be facing this one of the Stalin Empire style buildings, this huge, enormous 
construction on Kershatic, which I think uh, some of you may have heard as well, which considers to be one of the main, or maybe if not main, but the most famous street in Kyiv, is actually not that long, it's like a bit more than one kilometer long, and it starts from European Square and goes until Bessarabian Square. Um, in Bessarabian Square, there actually there is the famous, semi-famous um, Bessarabka or Bessarabian Market, which is an in-house market where you can go in and buy some stuff. Hershatic in the weekends is usually closed down. So actually, maybe it's only a Sunday that is the day when it's becoming the pedestrian, not both weekends. So on Hershatic, there is a lot of beautiful buildings. It's super wide, it's super nice. Um, there is the Kyiv State Administration, where the head of city is sitting there and just the whole council is sitting in there. Probably one of the other buildings, there is this famous department store called Tsum, which was recently renovated like a few years ago, before it was fully closed for a long time one of the main places in Kyiv and probably those that are becoming super famous um, in other countries as well, that is Maidan Zaleznosti or uh, Independence Square, which is the literal translation from Ukrainian. It's one of the most prominent and important landmarks in Kyiv and probably in the whole Ukraine. I think Maidan itself became just a common word that people would use to refer to not necessarily just the square but also to the event of revolution and process happening especially in the Eastern Europe during the normal times there is it's it's a square there are some trees there are some other monuments there's of course this huge pillar with the statue of independence and it's called independence monument of course and uh, just itself uh, the square is quite big or some other buildings surrounding it. And I remember my first time visiting Kyiv. I, th I think I have most of my memories about that uh, specific square, just because um, how grandiose it was looking back then, uh, still, I think, uh, does look good. The last but not the least in this uh, video, I would like to talk about the uh, National Museum of the History of Ukraine during the Second World War. And this is uh, now the official name of this huge complex that uh, basically dedicated to the Second World War. I think one of the most important monuments there is the Motherland Monument, which pretty much the portrays the, the most patriotic vision on how the motherland sort of looked there with the sword and shields protecting, we were all protecting the motherland and motherland stood up for itself and we all fought for its independence from back then, the Second World War, from the German Nazis. And um, there was also a huge complex with different machinery, war machinery, like tanks, um, I think helicopters, some other things that usually used during this terrible war event. There is the flame of glory. It's supposed to be there for the eternity and then there is also the monument of crossing of Dnieper with uh, just different soldiers and machinery and weapons that they were all carrying, which is also one of the most important moments in the history of the Second World War and how the back then Soviet Union was fighting back the invasion of uh, Nazi Germany. So inside of the complex of um, Motherland Monument, there is now a museum of uh, the development of the Ukrainian nation, which I think is something I will talk about in a separate video. So this is part one of my video about Kyiv, and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I wish you all the best, and I hope one day you all be ready there to enjoy this beautiful city, and uh, check out part two.